Okay. All right. So, like you said, my name is Miles McNamara. Uh, we're going to go over Mongoose OS. Um, so let's go ahead and start off. Uh, we'll go a little bit about me. Um, I've got a little bit over 15 years experience development, uh, starting from like Visual Basic 4 stuff. Um, I started an Orlando web hosting company here. Um, I love open source because that's how I make my money, um, which is kind of a conundrum right now. But um, I do that, uh, I'm actually a WordPress developer, which is where I make my money. But um, you know, I'm a tinker, a hacker. I like to build and make my own things. So that's what kind of where I got into the IoT side of things. And then friends, people started kind of getting in touch with me. They're like, well, hey, can you do this? Can you do this? So it kind of blossomed from there. Um, before that, I used to work for a company called Transcore. Um, who actually designed the RFID systems for ePass. Um, so if you ever look at the back of it, it says Transcore on the back of it. Uh, I know you guys did some work for them too, I think. Um, but I did pretty much everything you can imagine for them, um, whether it was designing network topologies or dealing with RFID stuff or being a project manager. Um, so let's uh, dig right into Mongoose OS. So uh, first thing, whenever I was looking around, there's so many different things you could kind of pick from, whereas, you know, you could use Arduino, there's Platform IO, there's so many different frameworks out there that could have been used. And so my first project um, that I was working with was, of course, Arduino. We kind of got that stuff together and, you know, it's a single file kind of thing. And so after that, you get this big, huge monolithic file that's long and it's just very annoying. Um, so I went and I literally did probably three or four months of searching online, researching different types of frameworks that were out there for this or that. Um, and I ended up deciding on Mongoose OS, and these are some of the reasons why. Um, so the company behind uh, Mongoose OS is a company called Sasanta. Uh, they're based out of Ireland, um, and they actually created uh, the Mongoose web server, which is one of the most popular web servers uh, for embedded devices um, that's out there. Uh, they've actually got uh, something that they put together for NASA, which is actually on the International Space Station. Um, they've got huge different companies, which I'll show you in the next one that's on there. Um, but a lot of times, if you guys have ever poked around with some devices you may have at home, you've probably seen at the bottom something or in the user agent it says Mongoose or, or Mongoose. Um, they were the guys who made that. So that first kind of sparked my interest into it and was one of the reasons I started to kind of give them a little bit more credit towards things. Um, but these are, this is just a picture of all their different clients that they have. Um, so they've basically sold licenses to all these companies to use their stuff. So it's been used in and out. Now this is just for Mongoose, their, um, the web server stuff. Uh, but they ended up taking that kind of ideology and that networking stack from there and then moved it into um, building out this Mongoose OS, which is the framework for building IoT devices. And they've been working together obviously with um, Google, all the, your major cloud uh, partners and stuff like that, they partner with them to actually get you know, Google and all them to recommend their products. So if you go on any of these, these, their sites, you'll see that they recommend one device or another. Um, right now they've got over 100 commercial products out there that is actually using Mongoose OS um, with you know, 250,000 devices in the field. Um, they've got a lot of native integration with different providers and stuff like that, like I said, Amazon, all those. Um, they're, community version of it, which I'll get into that a little bit more, is open source under Apache 2.0 um, licensing. Now, it actually used to be licensed under GPL, which if you guys know GPL licensing, the way it works is basically what it, you know, coming down to <clears throat> is that you ended up having to release your source code if you wanted to use their free, you know, their open source version of it. Um, and I don't know if it was just out of happiness, but I literally emailed them and was like, this is not, it's not feasible. I can't, I'm gonna abide by the license, but you know, if I'm gonna turn something into a commercial product later, I have no problem buying a license, but having it under that license, I swear, two or three days later, they switched the license to Apache. I don't know <laughs> if it was just, I was the straw that broke the camel's back or what it was, um, but they switched it. Um, so some of the other things, like I said, that brought me to it was, you know, I love JavaScript. And I've noticed that when I was looking around at different things, they had this, you know, strict, type of JavaScript, they, which they call MJS. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, they have that which allows you to write the JavaScript stuff, uh, the command line tool. They've got a beautiful command line tool that's actually written in Go, which is open source, that handles all the mundane tasks that go along with building an IoT device. 
Um, and we'll go through a lot of this other stuff a little bit more in detail, but you know, security, stuff like that. Um, so they actually extend the native SDKs for whatever kind of device you're building on. Um, they support a bunch of different ones. And let's just move forward here. So these are the supported devices that they have right now. And it's basically cross-platform compatible. So if you build software, or if you use Mongoose OS to build your software, whatever it is, you can build that and you can flash it onto an ESP32, 8266, any of these devices that you want. Um, so that was kind of big for me because my first project, uh, we were using an 8266 and you know ended up after that we needed more GPIOs and then we switched to the 32. I didn't have to change anything. I just changed one line in the config file and the build was perfectly fine. So this is just kind of a list, an overview, I know there's a lot on there of all the different APIs and side of things that they have available. Um, so as you, if you guys have messed with Arduino or Platform IO, you know that there's all kinds of libraries people have written, they've released. It's a little bit oversaturated in the sense that, you know, some get updated, some don't. And this is what they have that are native to them. And so everything, and we'll go a little bit more into this stuff. This is all native stuff that's core that has either um, C, C or C++ handling that you can call. Um, and these are basically libraries. So they each have all these different libraries that can do anything for, you know, if you're looking for drivers for a specific type of device, um, you know, display, whatever it is, they have these ones that are specifically built for Mongoose OS to integrate natively with it. Um, but if there's say an Arduino library that you wanna use in Mongoose OS, they also have a compatibility library to where you can easily convert it to work in Mongoose OS. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit more too. Um, but as you can see, it's a lot of the stuff that in an IoT device, when you're building it, you know, it's, I was going through and, and I started with the platform IO stuff and just mundane things like configuration, you know, basic stuff that an IoT device is gonna require, required a lot of work in Arduino and platform IO to get it all working and get it all kind of together. And so Mongoose OS kind of brings all that basic stuff you need for an IoT device and kind of puts it together into one that you can use. Um, and so I don't know about you guys, but for me, the easiest way I learned to write code is by looking at code, um, looking through other people's stuff. Um, so I'm gonna start out here and just kind of show you the basic structure of a Mongoose OS application. Um, so that once we start referencing some of these files and stuff, you guys know what I'm referring to. Um, and so you obviously you'll have your build directory, which is kind of displayed right here, where you can see where after you run a build, it'll generate the zip file for the firmware. You have your depths directory, which is going to have all of your libraries that you install, which we'll go over those a little bit more. Um, and then you have these other directories here, the FS, include, source, and then your MOS.yaml. Um, the FS, include, and source, those can be user defined in your MOS.yaml file. Um, and that's basically going to be either your C files and your you know, C file sources, your C headers. And then the FS is where you can put your JavaScript files. And these can all be user defined in the config file itself, which is kind of what's on the right there. So here's an example of the MOS.yaml file, the config file. Um, what it does is whenever it runs through the build process for these config files, um, it goes through here and this is how you basically define what your libraries are, um, what your configurations are. So you'll see the config schema. There's just two of them right here. So I'm basically in here, I'm overriding the default configuration from the MQTT library to say that I want to use this server address instead of what it may have in there. It may not have a value, but I'm putting that in there saying that this, in my project, this is what I want to set that to. Um, and then you can see, like I mentioned, the includes directory, sources directory, file system. And so the file system stuff for the JavaScript files, it isn't recursive. So it's not going to, you can't put one inside the other and it'll do those. You have to add them, each one that you want in there. Um, and the reason being is because um, we'll go into the file systems a little bit more too, um, but it basically creates a uh, SPIFFS, which is a flat file system. Um, so you can't actually have directories in there. And so I guess when they set this up, it's just, you have to define which ones there are. So below that, you'll see we have libs. These are where you define all your libraries. Now I added a little bit more on here so you can see how you can add different configurations, um, but this is where you literally define it. So if you wanted to add the, you know, the boards library, I probably could put a better one here. So it'd be the same thing, you move, remove boards and you put MQTT. That basically includes that library when it builds your Mongoose OS app. 
So if you don't need MQTT, you don't have to put it in there. You can leave it out. You can have a basic standard app without it and it allows you to easily go through. I mean, you know, platform IO, it's nice. You have a GUI to where you can select what you want, but if you're writing code all day long, just hopping into this file real quick, commenting out a line, rebuilding it makes it 100 times easier to go through. Um, and they're all based off GitHub repositories, which are all open source. Um, and so if you wanted to use a specific tag, a branch, something like that, you can define it right below that. If you're working on a, a local custom library that you're using, you just put the name, use the name there. And then you can also add a bunch of different other configurations for the build, the CDEFs, build bars, stuff like that, um, when you're actually going through the build process. So uh, this kind of goes over it a little bit, just like I was mentioning before. So it's a framework for building apps for low powered microcontrollers. And there's a few different components. So the first one I briefly touched on was the uh, MOS tool, which is the command line tool, which was writ written in Go. And that gives you immense power over building, setting up, creating everything up for your device. Um, the build tool chain. So the way that MOS builds the firmware for your devices is you can either do it locally with a Docker, you have to install Docker on your, your laptop, um, and you can do it through Docker and it'll actually pull down the SDK of whatever it is and it'll do the build on your computer. If you don't want to do it on your local computer, you can just do the normal build, it'll upload it to their server and then it'll do the build for you. I don't feel comfortable with sending my source files somewhere, so I do everything locally. But it makes it very easy to do whenever you're doing anything. Um, and so like I mentioned before, they have a bunch of different libraries and example apps, which there's some links right there you guys can kind of see um, that you can go through. And it's, I liked when I first started going through it that it had you know a lot of the standard libraries. And a lot of them are people just like me who start doing it and working on a project and say, oh, I need a library for you know the ILI 9341 display. Well, I just got lucky somebody had already done it. So it was available out there to make it easier to kind of write it. Um, but as you'll notice here, when you're actually seeing on this, this diagram, you can see all the different um, types of devices you can have, which still uses the native SDK. And then you have the Mongoose over S core, which is kind of the core that runs everything, the different libraries that you can have. So like I mentioned, the MQTT, OTA, RPC, all that different stuff right there. And so your actual device logic, your actual application code, you can still interact with the native SDK if you need to. If you need to, you know, do something with the, you know, the ESP IDF or whatever, it's not a problem. Hmm. You can still do all that because it basically builds on top of it. And so, this is just a quick picture of the actual command line tool. Um, and so you can kind of just see, you can kind of see what it's about. And you can see all these are just the short list of options of what they have in here. Um, and so you can literally, whenever you want to run something, you literally run, you know, MOS build and it'll run, start running the build for you. If you need to flash, if you want to flash something in the device, MOS flash. If you want to list the files on the device, MOS LS. If you want to pull down the file, MOS git. If you want to remove it, you just use RM. So it also has it with, you know, one of the biggest things for me with the device is that any IoT device is going to have configuration. and. This config tool right here, you can literally type in MOS config git, MOS config set, and it will pull it down or set the configuration on that file. And we'll go through the config files a little bit more here in a minute. Um, but as you can see, they have different stuff for the different AWS, Azure, um, even for debugging core dumps that come out. Um, you can kind of go through that stuff. Um, yeah, that's just a short list. They also have a UI, which you can run from the command line tool. I don't really care for it myself. Um, they used to have a better UI, which they removed, which was all web-based, which I was really upset about. Yep. Um, and I kind of started a rift about it. And of course their response was, well, it's open source. It's still there. You can extract that and create it if you want. I think the problem was is that their web UI was nice, but they had so many features in it that they just weren't able to maintain all of them with having issues left and right. So they kind of slimmed it down to this cross platform tool, which once you're getting started out, it does work fairly nice because it gives you a command line here. Um, and then you can have the console output here too, which is just, you know, if you want to see the output from the device, it's MOS console and it'll actually uh, put everything out for you. So the file system for Mongoose OS, the way the file system is set up is with a virtual file system label uh, layer. And so basically 
you have, I think there's what, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six different types of file systems you can set up on here. Um, and these are all separate libraries. So if you wanted to use the little FS, you would just put that library in your config file and you would end up building it with that library. Um, they've got a library for handling things just like an FSTAB would. Um, you can actually create a virtual file system on RAM if you wanted to. Uh, it's it's kind of gives you your own options of which way you want to go based on your device or whatever you're kind of doing. Um, because with Mongoose OS, once we get into the OTA stuff, I'll go over it as well, um, they already have it set up in separate partitions. And doing this, I was, you can easily create an extra partition on your device. So I have images. So for my, one of my commercial devices, we have images for, you know, on the screen. I don't need those to be updated on a firmware update. Those are large files. They don't need to be on my main system. I just created an extra partition, put those files on there, one and done. Um, and so like it says here, the file system, it all depends on whatever you have on there. Um, you can see the config files there. And we'll go through those a little bit more here in a second. And so one of the big things about that drew me to Mongoose OS as well was their RPC mechanism, their remote procedure calls. And it gives you a huge advantage here to be able to set things up um, so that you can call them through WebSocket, MQTT. I mean, literally anything that you can think of, for the most part, you can call it through Bluetooth, um, pretty much everything. And it's very super simple to set them up. Um, and so as you can see here, so like as an example, you have a name, you know, gpio.toggle which they have a bunch of default ones already set up with different libraries. Um, but it allows you to send the commands to the device and set it up to do something specific if you're writing your own, whatever it may be. Um, and these, this just kind of goes through the basic of, you know, an example of how you would send the command with the JSON that you would use, the response you would get. Um, it just, I'm pretty sure it matches two point, JSON 2.0. Um, but as you can see here, you can use UART, HTTP REST, WebSockets, MQTT, Bluetooth, all kinds of different channels that you can have to, to actually make those calls through there. So here's an example of uh, an RPC call. And so at the very top, and this is the MJS, which we'll go into a little bit more, um, but it, this is how easy it is to add your own um, RPC handler. So, and here in this example, we're just adding a, a sum RPC handler. And as you can see, this is in JavaScript. And it's literally just taking the args that are passed into it and returning back the sum of them both. And then you, if you wanted to call it from MJS, you can actually use um, rpc.local, which is a loopback basically, to make an RPC call. So if you've got some code stashed over here that does something, um, you know, for example, the product I'm working on is a misting device. You know, have an RPC call to turn the mister on, turn the mister off, turn the display on, turn the display off. Um, at the time I'm building my app, I have the functions available. I can just call those functions, but I figure out later on, well, now I need to be able to call that RPC endpoint from my mobile app, from the web app. I need to be able to call it from here, from there. So you can actually use this loopback to call everything. Um, and once again, with the command line tool, as you can see down there, you can call, you can use a command line tool to call these RPC endpoints as well. So if you're doing it over, you know, serial, you can use that as the port. If you want to do it over a WebSocket, you can do that. Um, if you want to do it over MQTT, you can do that as well. It gives you a versatile and a lot of different ways that you can actually do these to make it easy to set everything up. So the device configuration, I had briefly touched on the device configuration for Mongoose OS. Um, my favorite thing about Mongoose OS has got to be the way they handle configuration and their OTA stuff. Um, and so this is just gives you an overview of the compile time stuff for the <coughs> configuration. So that MOS YAML we had in our project file, every library has its own MOS.yaml file and it has different configurations set in them. So whenever you compile the configuration down, it actually generates these default files and you can kind of see on here, it actually generates these default files, the YAML files, which have every configuration from all the libraries, from your project, everything, and builds them down. Um, and it actually creates helper functions that you can use in C to actually call to get any of those config values, to set any of those config values. Um, 
and this is this is just kind of the whenever it's actually when you're building it when you actually compile it um, which is the defaults so yeah but the real meat is right here is the runtime configuration so the way that mongoose os has set up the runtime configuration is you have technically nine different configuration files you can have. You can have conf0.json through conf9.json. Now conf9.json is the user configuration file. So um, when you call a function or you make any configuration changes in your software, it's all saved to conf9.json. The good thing about the way they handle their configuration is that all this conf1 through conf8 those can be, so you can have comp five, which could be vendor specific configuration. So if I don't want my end users able to change the MQTT address, I don't want them to change, you know, um, some setting on there, I can actually use one of these files and it goes sequential, so one will overwrite the other. So as it goes up that, that line, it'll actually overwrite that value. Now, you also have, I don't have it on here, but there's also a, an ACL configuration you can set in there to where you can basically prevent anybody from overriding a certain value in their conf9 file, um, which actually there it is right there, conf ACL. Um, but it allows you to be able to push up these, push these files to the device. So if I needed to push, you know, the way I have it now is we have our vendor configuration, which is our MQTT stuff, stuff that no end user is ever gonna need to change. So I have that one file I basically push that when I build a new device that's to provision it, send it out, I push that, you know, comp five to the device. I don't have to worry about the user configuration file. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And when I make a change, if we change it anywhere in our system, we just push that same file. We don't have to worry about messing up anything in this or that messing up anything in our file. And it just creates, it makes it way easier to handle configuration and not have to worry about the, you know, something overriding this or this or that. And it's, I was super excited when I found it, to say the least, just because it made things a hundred times easier. And that actually just gets compiled down to your runtime configuration that you have. So the other thing I mentioned, the OTA stuff. Um, this is, like I said, is one probably one of my favorite things. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with any kind of devices in the field that you've ever, um, you know, firmware done a firmware upgrade on, and well, well, it looks like the device didn't come back online. Well, oh crap. What do we now? We got to go drive multiple hours. I know you know because we work together. <laughs> yeah, we've been through it. It's, you know, it was one of those things where having this kind of OTA, so the, the drawback to this, their approach, and, and I'll go through that, is that it has different partitions. But basically, the way that it works is for their OTA stuff, whenever you push out an OTA update to the device, which there are numerous mechanisms, um, if you don't have a license uh, for, their, your software, which is, I think they are about two bucks a piece if you get them. Um, you, can, you, you can only use the HTTP post, so you can only post the file to the device. It'll still do the whole OTA stuff, everything still works fine. Um, but if you want to actually have the device, you know, get the file to where you send it a URL, say here's the firmware, you download it, update yourself, um, then you have to have a license or use their M- software. Um, but for local stuff you're doing at your house, it shouldn't be a problem. Now, when you get 100, 200, thousands of devices, you're not gonna be wanting to push that file to every device. You just wanna send it that Git thing. Um, but so the way that it works is, once you push that OTA, it'll actually have, because once, as you can see here, the boot configuration, the way it's set up, it actually has two partitions. So you have your app partition that it's actually running on. You basically have a duplicate partition right next to that to where once you push that firmware update, it does an incremental update and basically puts that on that second flash partition. So it moves all those files, it moves the, the actual update you know, to image one right there. And then basically what it does is it sets a flag so that once the device reboots, which is what it does after it copies everything, um, that it basically marks that partition as dirty. And so it'll boot up into that partition, the device will start, and when the device starts, it actually starts its own watchdog timer, which you can set, which are a commit timeout, um, you know, say 500 seconds, whatever it is, to where if you don't manually commit that firmware, it'll revert, automatically revert back to the previous one, which is kind of a way to never brick another device. And so for my situation, the way we did it is, you know, I push out the firmware update, um, it receives the update, it, you know, flashes those files onto the second partition, 
it copies over any files that are not on that first are not on the, the new one from the first one, copies them over. Then it'll do a reboot. It'll come into that. It'll see that it is a dirty partition. And in my device, what we set up is I set up uh, basically a timer that says, you know, if the network and cloud is not connected for more than five minutes, revert back. And it's just kind of a fail safe in the instance that, you know, at least if a device is online, I can still connect to it. I can still do something to it. But if it doesn't have network connectivity, then I'm not gonna have, be able to do anything. Um, and then once you commit that, that actual update, um, it'll mark it as clean. And then if you send another update, then it just does it to the other partition. And it makes it so that you will never have a bricked device, technically, unless you commit it without checking anything first. But yeah, so um, what I kind of briefly touched into was the JavaScript side of things, which is what I really liked about this as well, which makes it very easy to do very quick prototyping and get stuff up and running. So they have what they call uh, MJS, which is their JavaScript engine, um, which is a strict subset, subset of ES6. Um, and so as you can see, it doesn't implement the whole language, just a subset of it. Um, you don't have any standard library like string, number, regex, date, function, stuff like that for of. Uh, it's very, it's like a basic version of JavaScript, um, but it's also small enough to where, as you can see, it's, you know, fits on less than 50K of flash and it uses less than 1K of RAM. Um, because we all know on embedded devices, space and RAM is very, very limited. Um, especially if you're trying to prototype or build something that's gonna be widely distributed, you don't wanna have to spend twice as much money on something. Um, and so there's a few things, you know, it's just like no var, only let. Um, if you wanna create a new object, you can use object.create, which they have. Um, and it just, it just makes it much quicker to create software, so to speak. Um, so here's, kind of some stuff that goes over their built-in API that they have. Uh, these are just some examples on here, um, but it's just, you know, printing stuff to the file. Uh, and I'll show you guys a file here in a minute so you can see how it actually works. Uh, but you have your one main init.js file, which you can then load other files into. And so you can either pass an object to that, which will then be considered the global namespace in that file that you're loading, or you can just omit that and it'll be the global namespace. Um, JSON.stringify, JSON.parse, those I use tremendously just for, you know, if I'm, so there is no um, parse int for if, you're, if you need to change something. So you actually have to use JSON.parse. Uh, so there's a few little caveats with it, um, but being able to build IoT devices by just writing JavaScript was, that was huge for me. Um, like I mentioned, so the objects and stuff like that, you can create those. Uh, it has stuff like slice, index of, um, splice, you can see here too. Um, and then you can also do stuff with uh, backing it by memory and C. Um, and one of my favorite things right here too with their MJS stuff is the FFI, which is foreign function uh, integration or import, uh, which basically allows you to import C functions into JavaScript. So you can literally call your C functions from your JavaScript files, which is huge. So this goes in a little bit more into what I was just mentioning about the C, C++ interoperability. Um, so with MJS, like I said, the FFI stuff, um, so you know, if we wanted to call the floor um, method, literally that's all you have to do in JavaScript to call it, and then you can call it like a normal JavaScript function. <laughs> it makes it so much easier because, as example for my project, um, a lot of my stuff, um, I had to go back into writing in C because you know, like, so I built a menu for our screen. Well, that menu in our screen, I didn't want to have to write every menu item in C, so I used it in JavaScript, but I actually have the handling for the display in C. So I was able to basically use that to keep the latency down and actually, you know, have that delay on the screen as it's actually doing it. But then I, I can literally go in there and just, you know, edit the object or the array of objects that have each menu item. Um, instead of having to go back through there and then realize, oh, rebuild, oh, it failed. Oh. Okay, do it again. Um, it also supports callbacks too. So whenever you're calling a C function in there, um, you can actually do callbacks as well. So um, like I had mentioned, I'm, one of the project we're doing is a mister. So you know, once that mist completes, um, since it is called from JavaScript to start, well, I also need to know once it's done so I can handle you know, whatever I'm doing in JavaScript as well. And so that's where I actually use the callback handling that's in here 
so that it can actually make that call back to say, hey, this miss is done, um, whatever it may be. Um, so as you can see here, it's calling, it's setting this as timer, um, and it's using that as that one. Um, this probably wasn't a good example because MJS library does have an actual timer in there that you can use, um, which basically just <coughs> is that um, already in there. And it's kind of, a lot of things in, in Mongoose OS are done with timers. Um, even if it's just, you know, a timer like, you know, just updating the clock, you're setting it to show a different clock, whatever it may be. So here's an example of an MJS file. This would be the full init.js file. Um, so as you can see, like I mentioned, you have the load files. And so any of the libraries that you have are gonna all be uh, prepended with API underscore whatever it is. And so as you can see here, we're loading the GPIO MQTT uh, sys, which is a file based on whatever device you have. So you can see we can get the free RAM, total RAM, um, and then the config one. And so those config files I was just showing you a minute ago that we had uh, created, getting a configuration file uh, or a configuration value as easy as just cfg.get and then device.id. If you want to set it, it's as easy as cfg.set. That's literally it. And it handles saving the file, updating the file. Um, and so on here, I've also got it with the GPI for a button handler. So we're setting this one as a button handler set the pin, you can set pull up, pull down. Um, you can set, you know, actually how it's, if it's gonna be edge positive. Um, and then basically any time that, cause this is, so this is the callback function after you hit the button. And then it basically calls this, does this. And then right here's an example for MQTT. Based on your MQTT configuration, um, you know, the core libraries in Mongoose OS handles connecting to MQTT, uh, the SSL negotiation, um, username, password, whatever it is. So literally all you have to do is mqtt.publish or .pub, whatever your topic is, whatever your message is. Um, this is just printing it out to the console. So I briefly touched on the licensing with Mongoose OS and the different licensing stuff they have. So um, like I said, they had switched things over to the Apache 2.0 stuff. Um, with their limited functionality. Basically from what I've gathered in the Gitter chat room and talking to them is that, you know, they don't want some company to come in and, you know, basically use their open source stuff, strip it, and basically start using it for selling some mass product, and then, you know, not contributing back to the project, who knows what it may be. Um, basically the whole downfall of open source, um, which I had to get some clarification from them on the OTA stuff, which I did confirm with them um, just to make sure, but it kind of limits you. So the community edition limits you to, because it does have cron jobs. So you can set up a cron job, you can set, um, and it does have cron tab too. Um, you can only have a three max uh, cron tab entries and three cron jobs uh, with the community edition. And the OTA is only through the post, like I'd mentioned before with over the year updates. Um, now, if you do buy a licensing, they've just set up their whole licensing system, so they've got a whole web UI for it. Um, as you can see, it's two bucks uh, for a single device if you get there. And so, you know, with our stuff, uh, for our schedule, so for our missing stuff, we set them up on schedules. All I did was create cron jobs. So every day at this time, or whatever it was, run this. So, you know, obviously once that point, we're at the commercial point of things about the license. And this is just, this is the user facing stuff. Um, if you're going enterprise with them too, you can get even better deals. You just have to talk to them about it. Um, so the captive portal stuff. So uh, one of the things with, um, when I was building this device that I was working on was a coming up with a way to provision the device. So, you know, either you sell this device to an end user or you have somebody who installs it, whatever it may be, they're gonna need some way to provision it. They're gonna, you know, nobody's, we're not gonna know what their Wi-Fi username and password is. Um, and so what I came up with for handling this, which I actually wrote my own a library for Mongoose OS, which is all open source, um, was I basically built a captive portal handling for it. Um, and I'll go through and demo this real quick for you guys. Uh, but as you can see here, it's, it's basically so that, you know, if you're on your phone and, you know, you install this device, you turn it on, you plug it up. If it's the captive portal's enabled, you're gonna see a Wi-Fi network that's available. You connect to that Wi-Fi network and then it's gonna pop up this screen to set up um, different devices, whatever it may be. Let's see here. So 
I've got this one running here, and I'll actually show you real quick. Let's go over. So here's another, this is actually another config file. So this is for a demo application that I have uh, for the captive portal um, whole Wi-Fi stack because I, because everything is in different um, libraries and the way they make it so easy to have different libraries, I actually set it up so that the captive portal, let's see. So I actually separated each one into a separate library. So you have the captive portal library, which handles basically DNS query. So anytime you connect to the Wi-Fi on here, it responds to any DNS query with the IP address for the device. Um, so if you only needed to use just that part and you wanna serve your own web application, you wanna serve your own HTML files, whatever it is, you can use just that part of the library. Um, if you wanna do the Wi-Fi setup stuff to where it can set up the Wi-Fi stuff, there's another library for that. Um, and you can kind of, once you put all these together, it kind of builds out this whole um, setup configuration. So you can see we have the RPC stuff and then <clears throat> the web UI. And it just kind of makes it a lot easier to go through things. So let's go through here. And so as you can see here, this is the configuration file, like I said. And so you can see um, just a basic configuration. So, you know, the Wi-Fi station which is, uh, or not the Wi-Fi station, the access point. So literally it's just as simple as wifi.ap.enable true. You can set the SSID, the password. Now they auto replace the, the question marks with um, the MAC address uh, for whatever, when you do something like that in config files. Um, but, so this is my config file for the actual. Miles, can you zoom in a bit? Um, maybe. No. <laughs> you. Yeah. I'm gonna use the view drop down right, so the window drop down. Okay. So oh wait. Let's try a pinch to. Yeah. I'm pinch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just need my. It's control plus and windows. Command plus. You still mind. have a pinch. On yeah. I'm only doing it with my. Uh, what is it? Command plus. Yeah. That's not working. So. Command shift plus. Maybe you can just read every word for a baby. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, we're fine. That's yeah. our track. Um, I've only done it on accident. On um, code. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I use my mouse. I don't, I don't have my mouse on right now. Um, but let's see here. So, I mean, can you guys at least sort of see what it's saying? It's green. Yeah. I can read it. I can read it. I'm, I'm, at, the the front. Front. I'm so at the front of the room where the cool kids are. Oh, okay. Yeah, here. I got it. Oh, there we go. Wow. All right. Ooh. Is that a Logitech? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No. A real input device. <laughs> yeah, so um, human input. Like I was saying, you can see the different that. configuration values. So I'll show you real quick. So the default Wi Fi library, which is all underneath the depths directory right here. So you can literally go in here and look at all their different configuration files. And so I'm going to come in here and look at that that YAML file. So you can see, once I zoom in, you can see all those Wi-Fi configurations. <laughs> so these are basically the defaults that are included in that library. Any of them you wanna override, you just copy whatever it is, put that in your configuration file, and it'll override whatever is in this library. So, um, you know, and then all the station stuff is for the actual connection to it. Let's zoom out here. And so, that MOS tool that I was mentioning before. Um, so this is, and you can kind of see up here up top, I don't really need to read it, um, but this was just kind of the whole build process that it went through of actually building it. Um, and literally, if you wanted to flash the device, it's literally MOS. Now I might have to specify my parameters. So I actually wrote an alias to handle this. Um, flash. Yeah, the, no. All right, well, that didn't work well, now did it? 
Well, I'm not gonna flash the device, but it's, <laughs> it is normally that simple as doing it. MLS flash, there it is right there. Well, your flash failed and you didn't break it, so you're... Yeah. It looks good. There we go. That was the SOS. Yeah, and it's, and it's, you know, I honestly think it's just because of this Mac. Um, but see, you can specify pretty much any of the parameters when you're flashing it, but it's literally that simple as flashing it. And the OTA stuff is that firmware.zip file that it generates, <coughs> the only file that you need to push up to it. And once it actually flashes it, I can actually go into the console too, and I'll show you guys that. Um, but it just makes it much easier to debug things. So when you're actually doing something, you're working on it, if you have something printing in the console, um, you know, like I said, it's changing configuration values, setting configuration values. Uh, I know when I was building this library, it made it 10 times easier to actually build it just by being able to use the command line tool um, instead of having to actually figure out a way to edit the file, push the file. Um, and I mean, you know, you can figure out all the commands you can do. You can write aliases for it, but it's just a lot easier and nicer to have it there available. So let's pull this up. So right now this C portal one, so like I said, you know, you can see it replaced the, the Mac address on there. And so this should prompt on, on my MacBook. It's not gonna ask for the password. I think I've already done it. And the idea is just like, you know, on your phone, it prompts and says, you need to log into this network, whatever it may be. What's it? Welcome. Welcome to SS. Get it? Oh, not auto capitalize. And this is just the, the UI that I built out just for the library itself. Um, you can see down here the RPC response, and it's basically using the RPC to handle it um, to do everything. And now the device is connected to Wi Fi. Um, if you change the setting in here to where it would automatically, I have a setting to where it can automatically disable the access point. Uh, it'll reboot the device and then the screen would basically disappear. Um, I think that's about it. Any questions? Do they still have the FTP server as a part of the OS or they removed that? Um, not that I know of. Did you, were you aware that that was a part of, so it used to be back when the, they had the nice web version of the interface. Yeah. It used to be that you could even FTP in if you really, if this is a good um, thing, and you could change JavaScript so. files on the... Yeah, so, that's, so that was the whole thing, is that's, um, because they have a, a VS Code uh, plugin too, um, that kind of does that as well, so you have it basically in your file browser window on the left, um, and all it does is uses those, the command line tool, you know, MOS put, MOS get, um, I think that's the problem they were having is with the web UI, um, sometimes it would save, sometimes it wouldn't, it was really finicky, um, and so I ended up doing with a lot of my development stuff is just, um, I actually forked their Visual Studio Code plugin, added my own little tweaks to it, um, just to make it easier to, to push things, to reboot the device, call commands, um, you know, mundane tasks that you're doing over and over and over again. So that's where the RPC stuff came in handy was that it was super easy to just call this RPC command to do this, do that. Um, I even set it up in there to where I made an RPC function to where I could call functions JavaScript functions with that RPC command. So I can actually send it to Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, now obviously that needs to be removed before production. But, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, but no, I don't think they have FTP or anything like that. But I mean, it should it would be easy to make, honestly. So if it's a Apache license, how come they are limiting to three tasks or three cron jobs? Uh, just like I mentioned before, because they don't want you know some company you know coming in and, and taking the software. It's, it's clear why. But yeah. How are they doing that while licensing under Apache license? So that's the way. So basically, the way that they worked it out is the cron, the cron, the cron tab. Um, those libraries are not open source. Oh. Uh, yeah. So but that's you can write your own, presumably. If you're yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So they actually they they just changed that. Um, because I still have, I have all the sources because they um, originally did not have them closed source. Mm -hmm. um, you just got, or originally they weren't closed source to everybody, even when you have, so when I bought my licenses, they gave me the sources to them or the, the access to GitHub, but um, basically that's what they did. They just closed sourced them 
and you know a bunch of us complain this and that and they're like listen it's it's what we got to do to kind of protect ourselves because you know you still get three of them you can still do it if you want uh but you know and i, I understand i get it and i agree yep. you know so it's so you said you can write a C++ code, C and C++ code? Yep. Um, what version of GCC does it support? I have no idea. It, I had to go back, I hadn't written C in forever, and I literally had to go back and figure it all out again, and then pointers, 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 to a pointer. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> no thanks. But um, you can configure all that though, I'm pretty sure, because the, the build tool chain they have, the way they have it set up, I mean, you can set it up however you want. Um, I wrote it all in C just because I was using their libraries as my example code to learn from, to figure everything out. So I went back in there and started writing it all in C. Um, but I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, because you can take Arduino libraries, you can take pretty much any code that you can find in there and, and it's very easy to convert it. Um, they have tons of helper functions and stuff like that available through their core library which is you know everything that you need in an iot device like i said the configuration you know wi-fi stuff like i can't tell you how many issues i had with just setting up wi-fi manager on an arduino and i had this issue here this issue here it was it was one of those things where it was just having something that actually works you know it's almost like you know i have a mac now but you know i i've always been a linux guy too after after you but um you know, a lot of Linux stuff, it's just a lot of headache to get it to work, to get it to work. Um, and so that's, that's one of my biggest thing is that when I got it, it's, you know, everything's open source too. So if, if you wanted to, to fork it, you know, besides the closed libraries, uh, if you wanted to fork it and do your own thing, you, you certainly can. Um, but it's, you can tell that they put a lot of time into it and basically use their background and knowledge from the Mongoose web server to be able to implement that into a whole framework around an IoT stuff. and. And I tried out literally five, ten different th different things I found online over a period of like four months, and it was a lot of heartache. But I decided on Mongoose OS, and I'm I was a little little sideways at first because just because there's not much online, there's not many tutorials, there's not a lot of you know documentation online about Mongoose OS. So I'm looking on there, and I'm like, well. You know where you know they've got a form but you know it's just community people like me you're even in the getter chat room like me that are responding to people just because we've been there we've been doing it so um <clears throat> it's a little hard to get started in using it but you know a year later i'm super happy that i went with it for sure by the way linux isn't as bad today <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it works pretty well sure yeah. some of us were shaking well, well, i'm good that, because yeah. i still have you know <laughs> I can still run my command line stuff. <laughs> no, you can run links to the VM. Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. Best of both worlds. So we're good. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, one more question: Are there what are what alternatives to Mongo's Mongo's OS? Is there? Um, well, that's what I was saying. So I can't remember specifically because it's been a while, but I I know for sure that I started out using just basic Arduino, writing it in that, and then that's when I moved from Arduino stuff to get away from that because it was. You know, it turned into to be a project from just a one file project to being, you know, multiple files with all different types of stuff that I needed to build into it. Um, then I moved on to, plat like I said, Platform IO, which I actually open sourced some for Atom too for using Platform in it, IO in it. Um, and it was just, there were so many different libraries, you know, for just for their real time clock, there were four or five different libraries that were available for it. And I had to go through and just poke through every one of them and try and find, okay, well, what is this one? What is I ended up spinning well, I should have just rolled my own. So I spent more time going through them trying to figure out what was what, what worked. They hadn't been updated in four years. It's like, well, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And then, you know, a couple months later, you figure out, well, that was the problem. Didn't see that. So it's just, I just, I feel like if, you, if you're looking for a hardened, you know, tried and tested kind of framework that has the basic nuts and bolts of what an IoT device needs, then Mongoose OS is for you. It's for me. Thank you. That felt like a good good note to